a Can you guys hear me? Yes. Good. So, um, so how did how, what did you guys think about the uh, Linux tutorial part one? That was pretty helpful. So, who who is already familiar with Linux? A little bit, not that much. Yeah, just just a bit. I knew a little bit from CS one, but like not as much as the stuff we went into today. Good. So, Robert, how how about you? You were you're pretty good with Linux already. Yeah, like I had a dollar for every time I've been reintroduced to Linux. Yeah. Okay. So that's good. That's good. Then you're the person I want to ask. So, how do you feel like today's tutorial went? I think it went good. good. Like he covered some stuff I didn't know before. Good, good. Yeah, especially to me, some of the confusing stuff, like when I, you know, used to see people do piping and stuff like that, I was always like, what is happening there? It's kind of confusing, you know? Mm -hmm. Hey, man, did you bring cheese sticks for the whole class or what? <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> good. All right. Well, that's good. So let's see who's here. One, put your numbers on, would you? Two, Robert likes three. Let me get some water. Sanjay's four, Chuchin's five, six is Zane, I think. Yep, six is Zane. Seven's Leah, eight's Brian, nine, and ten. Awesome. Everybody's here. Good. So hold, uh, hold on one second. Kids playing the piano in the background. It's hard. It's hard to, you know to tell somebody not to do that, but <laughs> the show's got to go on. So let me see here, Brian, uh, Brent. Hey, everyone, feel free to, good, good, good. Okay, so now, Brandon is a uh, part of our Slack group, okay? So if you have any questions related to that kind of stuff, you can ask him, okay? So just let, let's recap a couple things. First of all, like I've told you a hundred times, See, the cat looks like a miniature cat when it's back there. Doesn't it, guys? Is it just me? Thank you, Tess. So, okay, let's recap a couple things. Um, the first thing I want to say is my goal with these sessions is to make sure that when you go to meet with your research partner and you start having meetings with Dr. Shaw, that you're ready to jump right in to maybe not the deep end, but at least the middle end of the pool and start working right away, okay? That's gonna do a couple things, okay? It's gonna make you look good and it's gonna make me look good. That's what you call the old win-win, okay? So I wanna say this, in general, I would like to reiterate the fact that if you have questions, always come to me first, unless they're personal problems that you have with me, which you know, I mean, I'm pretty cool, so I don't know how you do that, but so no, I'm just sorry, humble brag. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So if you have problems with me personally, you can talk to Dr. Lobo. Otherwise, technical questions, please talk to me or your graduate student first, okay? No one, I, and I know that some of you are still at an age where asking questions makes you seem like you're, you know, you, you're like, like the coolest person in the world. I'm not talking about anybody in particular. I've been there myself, okay? Here's what I want to say. It's not going to seem that way in a meeting with Dr. Shaw. Okay. Always flesh that stuff out here with us. And Ethan so beautifully said it that this is the idea team here. Okay. I would like, I would like to remind you that if you have ideas, try them, run them, get results, and then present those things to Dr. Shaw. I had an idea for this new network. I tried it. I ran it. These are the results. Oh, wow. You know what I'm saying? So there, in general, there should always be results tied to what you're trying to say. Okay. Don't go into a meeting with him and say, you know, like I have this idea for this thing and I wonder if it would work. And cause he's going to tell you to just do it and show me the results. You see what I'm saying? Is that a, is that a beer, Ethan? 
It looks like it. It's water. Oh, it's a, what? Yeah, no, I, I like putting way too much ice in my drink. So, oh, okay, okay. I, you know, kind of prevents it from sweating. So, it looks like, it looks like a brouhaha from here. No, I, I'm not flexing like that. <laughs> I actually had, I was taking linear algebra one time. And at the end of, I say one time because I've taken it too many times to count. But anyways, at the end of the semester, somebody brought, I think somebody brought in a cooler of beer and this was at the University of West Florida. And the professor was drinking one of the beers teaching his final lesson. And he was like using, it was a beer bottle. And he was like using the beer bottle as the pointer. So he'd be like, now if you look at this matrix here and he'd like use the beer bottle. <laughs> so anyways, okay, right. so. So is everybody good on the whole, the, the, how things work a little bit. Okay. All right. Now, uh, I cannot stress this enough. You will be expected to work more hours this summer than you've ever been expected to work in your life. Okay. Dr. Shaw expects us as graduate students to work 72 hours per week. Right. He's already told you guys that nine, nine, six. You remember that talk? Right? He heard that from the Chinese and he's loved it every since. 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., six days a week. Now, I realize that that may be a little excessive for you guys. The point is, is that he will know if you're not putting in the work, okay? And then it's going to make you look bad and it's going to make me look bad. That's, that's what you call the old lose-lose, right? So if you have problems, if you get stuck on something, especially in these first two weeks, please make sure that you're on the same page as the rest of us. Because if you're not, it will be bad. Uh, it will not go well for any of us, right? First, he's going to yell at you, and then he's going to yell at me. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> okay, all right? So let's just, uh, just, just be prepared to put in a lot of work, you know? And so I want to say this one last thing. For your presentation, so we have a meeting with Dr. Shaw this Friday at 4 p.m., Okay. Um, I've asked that you go and harvest last year's presentations and steal whatever you can. Okay. And when I say steal whatever you can, I don't mean steal their results and their pictures like that. Don't do that. All right. That's savage. Don't do that. Um, what I do want you to do is you're going to look at their presentations. Their first presentation may not be what your first presentation should be because Dr. Shaw wasn't here for those first couple of days, and usually he is. So your first presentation with him is going to be a little more technical heavy than theirs was. Theirs was kind of like, hey, I'm Joe. I'm from this school. I'm an, interested in computer club, and AI has been my dream since I was a little kid. Okay, so that's not probably going to be your presentation. So maybe check out presentation two or something. All right, so let me say this. Your presentation... And, I, and Dr. Lobo is going to drop in tomorrow. He's going to want to see these slides. Okay. Your presentation slides will look something like this, probably maybe five slides. Okay. The first slide is going to say something. We'll talk about that later. The second slide is going to say the title is going to be MNIST classification. And then you're going to have two graphs. One's going to have train and test accuracy on it with epochs along the bottom. And then you're going to have another graph for loss, train and test loss with epochs along the bottom. Okay. So everybody with me on that? And then you can have a couple bullets saying something like, you know, my first, uh, you know, my, my, my best uh, accuracy, my best training accuracy slash validation accuracy was 98.3 comma 98.7. Okay. So everybody see what I'm saying? The first slide is going to be MNIST. The second slide, uh, yeah. the, the second slide is going to be CFAR 10 in Kiros. Okay. It's going to be the same setup. You're going to have one graph for train and test loss or accuracy. You, you mean the third slide, right? Because the first slide, the second yeah, slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm thinking, the only thing in my mind right now are the, the three slides that I care about, but you are technically correct. Yes. Uh, so, this, the third slide is going to have CFAR 10 classification. That's going to be the header, right? Or CFAR 10 dash Kiros. And then you're going to have your train and test loss on one graph. And then you're going to have your train and test accuracy on another graph. Is everybody with me here? 
Okay. And then if you want, like Ethan did some really cool stuff with trying some different experiments, put those in some bullets at the bottom, right? Dr. Shaw likes transitioning slides. Okay. So here's what's happening. You're going to load your slide. All you're going to see is um, CFAR 10 dash Kiros. Okay. And then you're going to push the button and the first button is going to show the pictures. Okay. Always lead with the pictures. Then you're going to press the button and then the next bullet's going to enter. Then you're going to press the button and the next, you guys are familiar with how those transitions work in PowerPoint, right? He likes where it, it builds as you go. Okay. Don't just present it all at one time. Okay. Um, then your fourth slide, Michael, is going to be, um, is going to be CFAR 10 dash PyTorch. And you're going to have two graphs for that. Okay. Everybody with me? Okay. The code that I'm giving you for CFAR. Now, you're going to, somebody's going to say this. So I'm going to answer this question now. And if somebody asks me this question again, I'm just going to say the word cat repeatedly. So everybody will know that if anybody asks this question again, and I just start saying cat, 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 you'll be like, oh, they asked that question again. This is the answer to that question. On that slide that has CFAR 10 for Kiras, that's assignment one with Kiras. You don't need to say, like, you don't need to include all that really nice stuff that Sunjay did on his Excel spreadsheet. You don't need to say, now, if you'd like to, to say a, a bullet about it, I noticed increasing the data set size from 10,000 to 25,000 had this much of a difference in my accuracy. That's good. But you don't need to include all those other graphs and stuff. You can make a few observations. Keep it short. Keep it to the point. Okay. Your last slide is going to have the PyTorch version. Your fourth slide is going to have the PyTorch version. So can everybody see these slides now in your mind? Right. Those middle, those three slides that I'm talking about are all going to have the same type of format. And if you want to share some bullets about it, then do that at the bottom. Okay. And make sure they get animated to where they come in. Okay. That way we're all kind of working with the same stuff. Uh, if in the event you did so much cool stuff, okay, Ethan ran a lot of experiments. We saw that. It looks really good, right? So maybe Ethan decides, hey, in addition to my single CFAR 10 Kiros slide, I need another one to talk about all the cool stuff I did. Cat, 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 cat. Is this an appropriate time? Sorry. Oh, that was a direct message, so you guys can't see it. Um, Lee, you know what? I'm going to have somebody else tell you what, what it said, okay? Uh, just hang tight. So Ethan may need another slide to include all those cool things that he observed. Adagrad did not perform like Adam did. Or et cetera, et cetera, right? You see what I'm saying, Ethan? Here's what I want you to keep in mind. Keep the results relatively short this performed better than this or the blah, blah, blah. And be prepared to read the room and skip material if he's not interested, okay? Dr. Shalai also did all these additional experiments and have the nice bullets there if you need to, right? On this page, maybe there's no transitions required. Dr. Shalai also did all these really nice experiments. Would you care for me to go into those details at this point? Everybody with me there? All right. Um, Brian, why don't you recap what's what's on the slides form? So someone asked what's on slides one and two. Brian, can you open this up real quick and repeat what I said, please? Uh, so our first slide is the uh, MNIST um, training well, test. Te technically the second slide, because the first slide is going to have some other stuff. Right. OK, so let's say okay. second slide, right? So the second slide will have the uh, MNIST uh, training and test accuracy and the training and test loss. And then um, just some bullet points about uh, what performed better than what, um, like, like why this performed better than this. The next slide is the um, CFAR 10 uh, experiment with Kiros. That's going to have the same graphs, uh, train and test accuracy, train and test loss, a couple of bullet points. And then the final slide will be um, CFAR 10 with PyTorch, same graphs and same bullet points. Brian, I knew I could count on you. You're good people. I knew it. Okay, is everybody good on that? I think so, but <clears throat> you said split the title slide 
and the actual like meat and potatoes of it into multiple slides we say like cfar 10 keras and then actually our graphs and then cfar 10 pytorch and then graphs uh however you do it just make sure it's on a single slide oh you do want it on a single slide cfar 10 keras graphs that's one slide <clears throat> Oh, okay. I thought you said like, oh, have no, no, that in the, like the header section, you know, on the standard slide, there's the header and then there's the body. That's yeah. All, that's all I'm saying. Oh, okay. For some reason, I thought you wanted us to make a, like a title slide. For... No, 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 no. Now you, your presentation will have a title slide. Okay. So I guess really bump everything up by one. Right. Okay. So now Michael, actually it's three, four and five. <laughs> okay. So slide one, oh, actually, you know what? This is slide zero. Okay. We're in computer science. This is not amateur hour. Slide zero is your title slide, okay? Slide one is just gonna say, um, you know, I'm from this college. These are some of the things I learned this week. Kiros, PyTorch, class, what does classification mean? What is a convolutional neural network? You don't need to explain that, Dr. Shaw. He knows those things. Just tell him what they are. And don't put anything that you don't know because he might ask you about it, right? Okay, these are the things I learned this week. These are the topics I covered. Linux, PyTorch, Kiros, uh, Anaconda, software installation, boom, 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 you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, these are this, you know, I've had some, these math classes. He always loves math people. That's why I'm here because I came from the math department and he loves math people. Okay. Uh, and then slide five, the last slide slide index at minus one how about that for you guys all right slide index at minus one whatever the last slide this is a perfect case of how that's you exactly all right the last slide is going to be the research projects that you're interested in okay tomorrow afternoon we're going to have a nice little meeting where the graduate students are going to come and they're going to present all of the research projects it's going to start at three o'clock they're going to get five minutes each and it's going to go to five o'clock I'll show you, how about I show you guys the schedule real quick, okay? Just to kind of get an idea. Of, um, so see, it's going to start here at three. You, you said this was Friday? Thursday, Thursday afternoon. Thursday, okay. That's tomorrow, starts at three. Object and text recognition and images shared in private Instagram conversations to detect risky content, okay? So basically they are spying on your DMs. So just, so there's no confusion by the way. Um, so if you were, <laughs> I, I don't know, maybe this is me because I'm actually just a child at heart, but I would be so tempted to write this out. So let me say this. Does anybody know what adversarial attacks are? Like on like deep learning networks or? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Here, here's just an example. You train, uh, the, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, um, that's when you like train your model with um, like, a, I guess a different model that's trying to make it fail. And so in that way you can like make it more robust to various. Um, Definitely some right, some right elements in there. Okay. Basically the idea is uh, your company has trained a model and I have used that model, whether what's called a white box or a black box approach. And I have figured out ways to, to fool your model into thinking something that's not true, okay? So for example, maybe you've seen before, have you seen how people have those like special sunglasses or a sticker they'll put on their face and it fools facial recognition? Have you guys seen that? That's a form of adversarial attack, okay? Yeah, so, some people have t-shirts that, that do that too. T-shirts, exactly, that kind of stuff, right? Or there's another one where they found that, like for autonomous driving, for example, stop signs, if you put a sticky note on a certain place on the stop sign, like a little uh, yellow sticky note, it would fool it into thinking that it wasn't a stop sign, that it was like something else, like a yield sign or something. You see what I'm saying? I think I heard something where someone put a piece of black electrical tape on a speed sign to make a number look different and it fooled uh, Tesla. Those are the kind well, so, so in that case, you know, that may not be adversarial attack because it may actually make it look like something else. You know what I mean? 
But the point of adversarial attack is to get into the guts of a model and figure out how you can trick it. That's the point. Okay. All right. So anyways, I, I don't want to go any, into more into that, but here's the final schedule. Okay. So you guys don't, can't see this. This is just for uh, the powers that be, but you can see the uh, document that Dr. Shared with, Dr. Shaw shared with us all. You guys remember that? It's that Word document, okay? Go through that. Anyway, so all of that to be said, on your final slide, you're gonna have the, the research projects that you're interested in, okay? There we go. And this needs to be done by tomorrow or Friday? I, I thought I heard both. You don't have to, I, I, first of all, you need to have a presentation, working on a presentation, okay? Um, you don't have to have it finished as far as the research projects are concerned because, you know, that's not going to happen until tomorrow afternoon. But you do need to have, I want to see all of those slides. Dr. Lobo is actually going to come in tomorrow morning at like 11. And he wants to see all of the slides with your accuracy and loss stuff. Is everybody clear on that? Is any, does anyone not understand what I'm saying? Everybody do a thumbs up right now if you do understand what I'm saying. Good. And Lee, you can just say, hey, if you understand what I'm saying. Oh, nice. That's exactly what I was looking for. God, that's so good. All right. Brilliant. Let's move forward. So yesterday we left off with PyTorch. Does anybody have any questions about what we talked about yesterday? The PyCharm code, I mean, excuse me, the PyTorch code that I've given you, you know how I say do assignment one with the PyTorch code? I don't necessarily mean do assignment one with the PyTorch code. What I do mean is that you should, should do CFAR 10 classification. Okay. So, for example, Dr. Shaw is going to say, why are your PyTorch results better than your Curious results? And you're going to say, well, because in my Curious assignment, I was experimenting with different models, various layers, trying to determine what the best approach was. In my PyTorch version, I used a VGG16 off the shelf. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. All right. So onward and upward. If I'm not mistaken, we left off here yesterday. Okay. So. No questions so far? Um, actually, uh, is it possible to run um, the PyTorch stuff on um, Google Colab or Kaggle or something like that? Because it takes a really long time to run on my computer. Absolutely. I have the same question. I have the same question. Absolutely. Absolutely. And here's what I recommend. First of all, if you don't already have PyTorch installed, I mean PyTorch, PyCharm, and you don't have virtual environments set up, those are going to be the first questions I ask you. So if Dr. Shaw starts probing you and he's saying, why don't you have this result? Why don't you have that? The first thing I'm going to say in that meeting is you do have virtual environment with Anaconda and PyCharm installed. And if you say no, I'm going to throw you right under the bus. I'm sorry to, you know, but I'm going to throw you right under the bus, okay? But if you want to take advantage of Google Colab because it has a GPU, that's fine. Here's how I recommend you do this. You come over here, you copy all of the code, and you paste it into a single cell in Colab. See what I'm saying? That way, there's not various cells that we have to reset the cache and all that stuff. You just do it with one cell. That's it. So don't break it into various cells. Now, if you want to break it into various cells for your own personal project, portfolio that's a separate topic that's fine okay but now let me say this in addition you now have access to newton so if you want to run this on newton that's the absolute best thing you can do you could even tell dr shaw that i ran this one on newton and instead of taking you know 10 minutes for each epoch it actually only took three seconds or one second you see what i'm saying so that's an option if you're looking for slurm scripts I got them. I got Slurm scripts for all of you. Okay. So for example, let me see. Um, you know, what makes me laugh every time I think about it. 
that you guys thought that that was my real picture on on Slack it gets me every single time. And Robert was like, "Well, I know there's a lot of rednecks in Florida or something." <laughs> Makes me laugh every time I think about it. Hey, you go down south far enough, everyone. Bro, bro, don't do Florida like that. Come on, man. We're in Orlando. <laughs> oh, man. Wow, I did me dirty like that. <laughs> Scratch me up. Oh, my God. Um, is, is there a way we can connect the terminal in PyCharm to Newton? Yeah. Y'all ready for this? Enlighten me on how to bring this model to, to an elevated domain. Hold on. Um, well, let's try this. Yeah, no, I, I'm seeing some graphical glitches from your screen share. You're not seeing it? Well, like it is, it's just kind of messed up. There are lines on it. Yeah, it's kind of hard to make out the commands that are being put in. <laughs> there we go. Um, Wait, I'm sorry, could you? show us the commands that you put into the terminal just before no they didn't well they didn't work so oh okay okay could not resolve oh i am so i am so dumb probably not connected to the vpn thank you there we go thank you it'd be like that so i'm assuming if we're on windows we're just doing this in the mobax no, uh, no, no, I'm, I'm trying to show you how to do it in um, PyCharm. Oh, okay, okay. In PyCharm, so. Yeah, because I remember struggling with that with VS Code, but then it was like so easy to run code. Hold on one second, okay? I don't know my password. I just, it's, you know, you know, these days you can't. Yeah. So I got to. It does at least like have the password thing come up when you like on mine it has the option to like fingerprint it. On the VPN? Yeah, like for the password. Like oh, right. the password? I, don't know what you're talking about. I have a fingerprint reader, not even it doesn't do that for me. Oh, that's very Wait, nice. So um on Colab, uh do we have to put all of the files in there? Um to run it because Wait. for the um, PyTorch code, there are like multiple files in the project. Yeah, yeah, you do. All the dot pies. Okay. All right, so here we are. I'm in the, uh, you guys can see my um, PyTorch terminal? Yep. Okay. All right, I'm connected now. Enter my passphrase. Uh, not. I thought it saved this for me. It's interesting that it didn't. Well, it's the passphrase, not the password. So it's no, 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 no. I, I mean, I have a separate, whole separate thing I set up to where I don't have to do this every time, but it's still. Okay. So Mac users, by the way, I'm going to show you at some point how to do this. Okay. SSH Newton. You can just type that in your end. Okay. You don't have to do anything else. That's pretty nice, right? So you asked me, what did you ask me? Can we do this from the, somebody asked me, can I do this from the PyCharm terminal, right? Oh yes, I, I did. How would you run it on the server? Well, first of all, you have to put it on the server. So- Okay, so let's, connect it. Let's look at this, okay, right? Yeah. So um, let's say I wanna make a directory, right? Let me move this a little far out of the way. Let me do this. Okay. So I'm going to make a directory. Make directory, right? Everybody see this? 
Uh, sorry, I, I, I don't mean to interrupt. Um, I, even though I'm connected to the VPN, I'm having trouble, uh, it's still saying SSH, uh, couldn't resolve as a host name, or couldn't resolve host name Newton. Somebody, is some, is anyone else connected? So if you just type the word Newton, like he probably has Newton as a macro for the full URL. So you have to, you can't, you can't do what I did. Oh, okay. I see. Sorry. Sorry. That's why I didn't share those commands. Cause I, I, you're, I have something specific set up to where I don't have to type it. It's just like a little, but it's only for Mac users. So, <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, that's, I may have created a private chat for Mac users in the Slack. All right. There. I said it. <laughs> I outed myself. All right. So let's check, try this. Okay. Um, let's, all right. So we can make a directory, but I'm going to try to, uh, I'm going to try to, um, what am I trying to say? I'm going to copy the whole thing. Right. So let me see if I can copy this path, copy path. Right. And I want to copy, I want to secure copy recursively. SCP, secure copy. I want to secure copy recursively, which means you have to do a directory, everything inside of it. And you're going to do from destination to source. Okay. So what's my, I mean, from source to destination. So what's my source, my local machine, right? Oops. Dang it. Now I got to edit that stupid thing out of the video because I put my stupid passphrase there. Swore I copied the path here. Absolute path. Oh, I guess I didn't do that. Okay. All right. This is where it's coming from, right? And I'm going to send this to now. You all cannot do this. Actually, nobody can do it yet, but the but you have here's what you have to do. You have to type in your username at the server name. So, like for example, Robert at um probably ist.ucf.edu, ist, um, I'm going to do it my way and then I'm going to show you how to do it in a minute. Newton, and let's just do here, tilde forward slash, let's see if that works. Can't be the authenticity of host, can't be established. Are you sure you want to connect? Yes, I am. Okay. Say what? Wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be easier if you. Oh, sorry. I should have. I'm sorry. I'm so silly. You just like clone the I'm... repository. I am so silly. I should have done this from my computer like this. Okay, terminal. I got to do it here. Okay. Now, for the rest of you, uh, excluding Tess and Robert, who I'm going to set up that Newton thing so it's much, much, much easier for you. But the, the rest of you should have MOBA X term, right? You can just drag and drop files, right? So you can actually just pretty much put the, the directory in there. Okay. So let's check now. All right. So I'm in Newton right here. So now I want to list and see what I have. All right. See how I have CFAR 10 classification right here? So Zane, to answer your question, you asked me a question. Can I run this how, from the terminal in PyCharm? Well, yeah, I mean, it's like any other, you, I don't think you can do what you're asking, what I think you're asking me to do. But what you can do is treat this like any other terminal, connect to Newton, copy the files over, and then run it like you would any other script. Does that make sense? Okay, so now uh, let me ask, um, actually, I'm just going to do it. All right, Chu, how do I enter into CFAR 10 classification? Um, 
you CD it. There you go, CD. And then I'm gonna put a capital C and then I'm gonna press tab. Bada bing, bada boom. Everybody see how it just gives me the full thing? Okay, now I wanna list, see what's in here. Data, data.py, loss.py, main.py, model.py, readme, requirements, utils. You know, it's not here on the other hand is a Slurm script. So, <clears throat> I wasn't going to tell you this, but I'm going to tell you it anyways. Remember how yesterday you saw how you can run code? It's like S batch and then whatever your, you know, job, your Slurm script's name is like, hey, dot Slurm, whatever you call it, right? Remember how it was, I'm, and I'm using the word hey to show you that it doesn't have to be submit. And really, this could be this. Okay. That Wait, doesn't. So I. So I did drag and drop the folder into MOBA X term, but um, when I press enter, it just says command not found. Somebody else with MOBA X term way in here. Uh, if you're dragging and dropping your entire PyCharm project, it takes a bit. Um, sometimes it takes like, what you'll want to do is cancel the upload and drag and drop again. Um, but if you should eventually see a little thing um, the bottom left that, hey, it's transferring stuff because it's it's going to take a bit. So one of you oh, should... So you, so you drag and drop it, but you don't press enter? You just you show your, oh, wait, yeah, yeah, I'll share my screen here. Okay. Actually, Chu, share your screen, and Ethan's going to tell you what to do. All right. Uh, uh, give me a moment. It's on a different... All right. I say MOBA makes this a lot easier. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad you guys can use that. You know what? I'd be really interested, though, for the rest of you, if you can do it by way of a uh, excuse me, through the Anaconda prompt. I think that would be an interesting piece of information to know because if you can do it through the Anaconda prompt, then I can pretty much set all of you up like I do, just SSH Newton, and that's it. Because like I could run the SSH command from, uh, what is it? Uh, from inside PyCharm, but the only thing is I don't know how to point it to the RSA key, so. Oh. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. So, Ethan, can you tell her what to do here? Okay. Well, if you look on the left, it shows your folder and you have not copied it over. So, here, can you close that little uh, file explorer window? Yeah. You see how it's going in the bottom left? Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, it, it'll, it'll just take a while then? It, it takes a hot minute, yeah. Okay. Did you guys see how fast mine was? <laughs> I don't know if that's because I use secure copy or because I have high internet speeds, but I felt like mine was almost instantaneous. I mean, granted, I still have, I think the, um, it's because it has like the zipped C, entire CFAR 10 data set. So I think that's here, right here. Actually, yeah. Anywho, let no, me I mean like the the let's see where is it? Yeah, the tar.gz for that. Well, actually, it's probably I total got... file size is like 500 megabytes. So if you don't have fast internet, it's going to take a minute. By the way, guys, I want to share something with you. If you look over here, right? Remember how I said how like I did the command that looked like this, right? And I did Newton colon whatever. Mm -hmm. For the rest of you to use secure copy. Instead of putting Newton here, you have to put your username. Mine is course.crcvreu at. And at the end, you're either going to put probably, it's probably not EVU, EV user one. It's probably not that, but I would try that. It's not for me. It's, it's not. Then try ist.ucf.edu. That's probably the correct one. It does say EV user one for me, but I don't know. Okay. Anyways, we'll, we'll go, Brandon will go more into that tomorrow. That's, uh, you know, something I want him to cover. But anyhow, 
All right, so let's let me if you're in Newton and you want to leave, right? You can just type exit. All right, maybe not. Sorry, control C, exit. Maybe just like that. There you go. Okay, just exit. And then I log see how it logged me out. Okay, this is what you would want to use then. So everybody else, where I typed Newton, what I should have typed is this course dot c r c v r e are you at Newton? Okay. This is in general how you log into remote servers. Okay. Your username at the server name. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Excluding using an IP address. Okay. okay. All right. I'm going to close this. Um, All right, let's run it up to this point to make sure that I'm still in my correct environment. Yeah, everything looks good. Okay. All right. Now, here's what we want to do. Uh, you guys can go through this stuff again. Okay. Now, if resume, so if you want to resume from a checkpoint, all right, what this means is a couple things. If you've run this mod, let's say you did this, right? And I know Lee, you asked me this before. You said uh, on Newton, when I run a job, do I have to stay connected the whole time? No. You use S batch and whatever your submit.slurm thing is, right? It's called a slurm script or a shell script. Once you say S batch submit.slurm, enter. Then your job is on the server now. It has nothing to do with you. And it's going to save those results in that output file that we created, like for example, percent J with a job ID dot out, right? It's going to save all that stuff on there so you can get off the server and you don't even have to think about it again until it's done. You can even set it up to where it will send you an email when your job starts. It'll send you an email when your job finishes, and it will send you an email if your job fails. You can even get it to text you. Now, that's a little more complicated. We won't go into that, okay? And, and after a while, you're going to get so many emails that you're going to turn that off, okay? Uh, but it's nice to know if your job successfully completes. All right, now, so my point is, is let's say, though, that you ran a model for 100 epochs and you want to save those weights and start back tomorrow, okay? Let's just say you were running it locally. Let's pretend that for a minute. You ran it on your local machine and your battery is about to die. So you want to stop training and then you want to come back and run this code after you've got your machine powered back up, okay? That's going to, if resume, where does resume take place? Resume is one of my hyperparameters that I define up here, resume. Okay, so if resume, then I'm going to enter into this loop and it's going to say resuming from checkpoint. We've talked about these assert statements. Remember, these just make sure that something is true before I move forward. Okay, os.path.is directory. This is a bool statement, returns true or false if whatever's in here is a directory. Or, I mean, I'm sorry, if it, if it exists, it can be a file as well, right? So checkpoint doesn't currently exist. Does everybody see that, right? So it would not go past this line right here. It should say error, no checkpoint directory found, right? So then it's going to say checkpoint is equal to torch.load. And here's my saved model. Does everybody see that? That's where I've saved my model at this file. Okay, it's not there right now. You can look over here and you don't see it. Okay. Net.load state dictionary. This is where you're going to load the weights. Checkpoint net. I also want to save a variable that I, this is something I do personally. I saved my accuracy from that model. Like, for example, if you trained up to 100 epochs, and you want it to continue with the output right where it left off, 
you need to know what the preceding accuracy was for the output to print stuff or whatever, okay? And uh, there's other reasons. And then you're gonna have, what is my start, e start epoch? So for example, you stopped at 100 yesterday. So where are we gonna stop today? Start today, 101, right? In the printing output, it's gonna be 101. And I'm gonna print, hey, your best accuracy for that previous model is X and you're resuming at a certain epoch Y. Is everybody cool with this? Okay. Now let me say this, loading weights in PyTorch can be a bit of a hassle. I wish we had more time to talk about it. We do not. So please pay close, close attention to what I'm about to say. When you load model weights, okay? When I load these model weights, these were saved from a model. These were saved from a model that looked, that was this model here, okay? The model weights correspond directly to the name of the attributes inside of this class. So for example, conv1a weights that I've saved will get loaded into conv1a. Does that make sense to everyone? The conv1b weights will get loaded into conv1b. If you load a model that has names that are different, let's say I load model weights that had a B here, but I don't have a B here. It will not return an error. It will just not load the weights. Okay? So you're going to go into this game and you're going to think all my weights are loaded. Conv1a, check. Conv1, check. Conv2a, check. Et cetera. But because this single name is different, that layer does not get assigned the weights that you saved. The names must be the same, okay? Oops, B. All right. Does that make sense to everybody? The names must be the same. And if they're not, there's a process you must go through, which I'll talk more about on Friday. There's a process you must go through to assign those weights. The reason I'm emphasizing this so much is because if the names are not identical to the weights you're saving, of course the shape must be the same. That makes sense to everyone, right? You're basically loading in matrices. You can't load a five by five into a three by three or vice versa. Doesn't make sense, right? So that's clear. So the, the sizes can be the same, but let's say test as a model and she doesn't put A's and B's on hers and I put A's and B's on mine. I if I try to use her weights directly, it's not going to work, but it's also not going to give me an error. Everybody cool? Okay, let's move forward. So this will allow you to do two things. It will allow you to resume from a checkpoint that you have saved. Okay, that's option one. It will also allow you to load weights from somebody else's model, assuming that the names and everything are correct. Is that cool? Right? If the names and stuff are not correct, typically you handle that process inside of your model file. Okay, let's move forward. Now, in this section, we've defined the optimizer function and the loss function, okay? I guess it's the optimizer scheme or approach method, whatever, and the loss function. Notice how here I say criterion equals loss, okay? and I have a loss file up here, right? That's not standard. I did this for a specific reason. A lot of the times papers that get published are because people make modifications to the loss function, right? They come up with a new equation, it's novel, you get published, you get a paper. Does that make sense to everybody? When I try to do that myself, that's where some of my research went. When I tried to do that myself, I didn't know how to edit the loss function. So what I did was, is I made a code. Remember how I told you that this data file just has source code in it? There's nothing special about it. It's the same, it's not source code, but it's the same idea with this loss function. This loss function just does what the normal cross entropy is gonna do. But I put the code here so that you can get an idea of how to edit it if you want. Where does it come from? So what do I mean by that? Class, loss, non-neural network, blah, module, blah, blah. Here, define my cross entropy, okay? This is gonna give you the standard cross entropy loss. 
And then I put another method or function down here, which says define my custom loss. So now you can come in here and edit the loss function and do some stuff that maybe you couldn't do before. Let your imagination and mathematical logic run wild with this happy face, okay? And then you have to put some stuff here. All right, does everybody understand the point of what I'm doing here? This is literally just the cross entropy loss. All I've done is added a separate file so that if you want to edit the loss, this template allows you to do so. Okay, there's nothing special otherwise about it. Okay. All right, optimizer, I'm using stochastic gradient descent here. Learning rate is, um, you have, you include this net, remember net is the name that I called my model, net dot parameters. So in other words, where do I want SGD to act on? What do I want it to act on? I want it to act on the parameters of my model. Learning rate, initial learning rate, momentum, told you ignore that. Scheduler, here's something we have not talked about. Okay, the scheduler, the learning rate scheduler, what it does for you, and I know we're going past one here, just bear with me, I'm gonna take a couple extra minutes. What the scheduler does is it changes your learning rate as you go along, okay? So you started with a learning rate of whatever initial learning rate was, let's go up here and take a look, 0 0.01, right? And then what this says is after 42 epochs, divide it by 0.1 or multiply by 0.1, sorry. Okay, multiply by 0.1. So in other words, it's just gonna keep going down 0 0.01, 0 0.001, 0 0.0001, every 42 epochs, does that make sense? Because a lot of the times you want your learning rate to start off strong, right? You want it to start off, you've seen this in your models, you want it to start off you know, a little higher. And then, but after a while, you'll notice the training doesn't keep up. So if you can drop your learning rate, your, your accuracy may not continue to go way up, but you're gonna inch it up just a little bit at a time, right? So now we're playing a different game. We're not playing the zero to 50 game, we're playing the 50 to 60 game, but 50 to 60 is still a big jump, right? And then you're not gonna play the 50 to 60 game anymore, you're gonna play the 60 to 65 game. Does everybody understand that idea, right? Yeah. Now, what I've done here, is define an entire function for my training, okay? Got to put this in perspective. If you come down here, you can put all this if, if name equals main, right? You can put that in there. If it, I know some of you were talking about that. But here, uh, excuse me, for epoch in a range of start epoch to stop epoch, train and test, that's what we do. Everybody cool with that? So I have two functions, one for train, one for test. They happen here. Okay. So let's go back up and take a look. Um, train. I'm going to measure the time it takes to train. All right. Now, the reason I'm going to do all of this, let me see real quick if I can pull this up. Is because I want results that... Are going to look like bear with me for a moment, please. Here we go. All right, so when I run code. It looks like I, I, it looks like when you run this code, it looks like this. Can you guys see this? Okay. Start time. I've already talked to you about that, right? Initializing parameters. Does this code look familiar? Right. This is the output that I do. Preparing data, building model, training model, okay? Learning rate. And then every, you're going to see these lines. Epoch, zero. Time it took to run the model. Loss, my loss. This is when I did something for myself. And then your accuracy, train, test. So does anybody know where I got this type of format from? Does it look familiar? I stole it from Kiros, right? I wanted my output to look like there. So that's why I got my code to look like that. And every time we save a checkpoint, that means we improved in accuracy. So here, save checkpoint. You can see it happens every single epoch. But then look, see how it starts to happen less frequently? 
right? In the beginning, we're training really good and then it slows down. Then I drop my learning rate, it starts to slow down, right? Look at that. We didn't save all that time. Then I saved the checkpoint, right? Is everybody with me here? Okay. So I'm going to tell my model that we're training. So I set it to net.train. That means the weights will get updated. In net.test, the models do not, the weights do not get updated. And I'm going to set a couple of variables here. Okay. I'm going to do a for loop for batch index. Batch indexes, if I do, if I have a thousand images and I have a hundred images in each batch, my batch index is going to go zero through nine, right? Inputs, which means the images, targets, which means their labels, and image IDs. This is just something I do personally. This is the actual name of the image file. Okay. Then we're going to do some stuff here. I'm going to send inputs and targets to the device. Hopefully it's a GPU. It's going to be faster. I'm going to zero out the gradient, which happens, which is left over from the previous run. Okay. And I'm going to send my inputs into my model and I'm going to get outputs out. Everybody see how this is nice and clean. There's all that other stuff is in model. So you don't need it here anymore. Okay. Loss is equal to criterion. That's the loss function that we used. And then I'm going to do backward. Uh, and then I'm going to move backwards. Okay. Here, optimizer. I'm going to step my optimizer. I'm going to add this loss to my list of loss. I'm going to uh, compare my uh, labels to the true labels. And then I'm going to uh, add that to another list. We'll talk more about that later. Time elapsed, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'm going to print all that stuff, which is all that output you just saw. Is everybody cool with that? Okay. Here in testing, go ahead. No. Here in testing, you can see I do pretty much the same thing. I set a time. Notice, however, I set a global variable inside of this function for best accuracy. Why am I going to set a global variable for best accuracy? Because if my model improves, then I want to update my accuracy based on what it was before. Okay. What that means is, is that every time my accuracy increases, I want to save the model weights associated with that. It's the same thing Kiras does. Remember that? How you can use that callback? No, I didn't copy all their stuff. What? All right, but I've, I mean, I kind of did this on purpose. I mean, the point is, is that you guys learn Kiras, you get used to a certain format, and I've done my best to mimic that here so that it's kind of less transition required. Okay. Now, here with torch, no gradient, right? With no gradient. In other words, I'm not going to do SGD. I'm not going to go backwards, right? Because I'm not updating the weights on my model, I'm testing. Otherwise, it looks the same for batch index, blah, 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 send it to the device, put it through the model, compute my loss, add it to the lists, time, print it out, right? Otherwise, it's pretty much the same. Does everybody see that? Okay. Now. I've got a question. Go ahead. The uh, the with statement? Yeah. Uh, I've never seen that before. What does that mean? You, you have seen it once. Remember how we did with open. So basically, it's like, um it's like kind of like a while i guess you could say but it's um we did with open as f we opened a text file so with the open function and call that thing f do something right here with no gradients with no sgd on your torch basically while that's true kind of that's the idea Make that true and then do some stuff. That's the idea. Okay. My code does not run on the PyCharm with exactly the same thing. I wonder why that's the case. Do you, I have some errors? Do you have you set the look in the bottom corner right over here, Lee? Yeah, I said it up. Yes. It says the same thing mine does? Yes. Then if I had to guess. Have you edited all your environment at all since yesterday? Have you installed PyTorch? Let's start there. Yes, I did. You installed PyTorch. Okay, we'll come back to that, okay? Okay. Worst case scenario, you can run this in CodeLab, like I said. Copy all of the code, 
the main code, copy all of the main code, put it into a single cell, and then put the loss file, the data file, and just add those to your collab, right? You know how you can yeah, add I can attach no, and that it doesn't work either. That doesn't work either. Yeah, it has some errors and ask me to import something. I did import that thing and it still does not work. It's weird. Well, but on Colab, did you include this file, this file, and this file? I put everything into the single cell. Yeah, but these are different files. You can't put those in the same cell, right? Those have to go into the Colab directory. Okay, I see. See what I'm saying? So just put model, data, and loss into your Colab directory. Probably utils as well. I don't know if I use that or not. I can't remember. Okay. And utils, right? So this one, this one, this one, and this one all have to go into your Colab directory and then copy all of the code from this one and put it into a single cell. Everybody okay, yeah, I see. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm, thanks. All right, now, so, okay. So we're in test, right? It looks pretty much the same as train. There are several differences. One of the major differences is this, save a checkpoint, right? So I told you before, remember above it said, if resume, that's how you load weights whether they're your weights or somebody else's weights that's the basic approach of loading weights and this is the basic approach of saving weights okay is everybody with me on that okay however i have some additional schemes set up here that i want to follow that scheme is accuracy is equal to so i'm in my testing function i've got correct divided by total times 100, that's obviously the accuracy. That's the formula for accuracy, okay? If accuracy is greater than best accuracy, which is a global variable, then save the weights. That's what I wanna do, that's it. And notice here, I'm defining this thing called state or what is the state of my model, right? I'm gonna save it as a dictionary. I'm gonna save my model weights. And remember before I told you I like to save accuracy in epoch. That's where these come from because I saved them explicitly. And then I say, if this isn't a directory already, make the directory and save your weights there. Update my accuracy, update the best accuracy. Everybody with me here? Okay, this approach should be pretty straightforward to you. Now, I just showed you this for loop here. The only thing that I didn't talk about was this. This is where I update my learning rate scheduler. We're not gonna talk about that right now. Okay, the code's here. You can come and harvest it anytime you want it, but we don't need to talk about it right now, okay? All right. So has anybody successfully got this code running on PyCharm? Okay, excellent. Thank you, Ethan. Um, I got it. I got it working. It didn't finish. I think uh, judging from the time that epochs were taking, it would have taken like four hours to- That's okay, it. but it did Same run. Here. It yeah, did it did run, run and it got to a point where it was like actually training. Yes. Okay, and that's what we care about the most. Because if it starts to the train, then that means you got all of the sizes and dimensions and all that stuff right, okay? Now there's one other thing I wanna say about PyTorch in case I forget, which I probably won't, but PyTorch, the way it ex accepts the dimensions. So for example, let me just show you this one last thing and we're gonna take a break. Um, PyTorch Conv 2D. Okay. Here, right? So remember how we saw before? We saw 32 by 32 by 3. Or that we saw before 28 by 28 by 1. Remember that last number was channels? Oh, so this is channels first instead of channels. That's last. exactly right. That's exactly right. So you have to you have to reshape it that way before you put it into PyTorch. Okay. I don't know why it's this way, but it's, it's something that you need to know about. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? You have a vector or excuse me, a tensor, whatever, an array that's 32. Let's say you have 10 images, 10 32 by 32 images, which are three channels. That means they're RGB. PyTorch is not going to accept it that way. PyTorch wants it to be 10 images with three channels, 
32 by 32. Cool? Okay. So don't forget that Dr. Lobo will be coming in tomorrow. He's going to want to see those slides. That's what he was telling me. Um, so today we're going to do lunch. And then this afternoon, Dr. Rawat's going to come in and he's going to do an introduction to deep learning. Okay. This is going to be heavy. There's going to be a lot of information there. Right. I hope, if anything, that to this point, you've under, you can understand that you don't need to understand everything to run code and get it working. Right. How many of you truly could sit here and explain stochastic gradient descent to me? But you use it on your model. You know what I mean? Don't get stuck if you don't understand something. Right. So code first. And in my experience over time, things will begin to make a little bit more sense. Okay. All right. So I will uh, see you back at two o'clock. Hey, Robert, can you please take a quick look at the stuff, like uh, at the errors? Yeah, sure. Oh, wait, quick Oops. question. Um, for the slides, like getting the accuracy and loss versus uh, epochs, uh, are we supposed to just make those graphs manually or? For which one? Um, so, like the graphs we're supposed to put on our slides. Of, for which, for uh, which slide? Which slide? My answer is different for different slides. All of them? Oh, first two, for the first two you're okay. using Kira, so you should be able to use ten TensorBoard. Okay, I haven't been able to get that to work. Do you have PyCharm working? Yes. Okay, so in if PyCharm's working and you can get the code working in PyCharm, then it should work that way. Oh, but, but in your case too, I think I saw you had functions to plot them already, right? With matplotlib. Yes, but I just manually did that in matplotlib. So instead of manually collecting those values, even if you have to manually collect them, that's fine. Okay. I mean, yeah, it would be annoying if we did a thousand epochs, but here, so you have the results. It's okay if you have to do it manually right now. Okay. You'll find better ways. Like, for example, did you see how I just saved the accuracy in that model that I was showing you from PyTorch? It's okay if, if, you know, in the future, you'll have stuff like that, that can save, you can add it to your list and stuff. That's in my PyTorch code. Okay. But for the time being, if you have to collect them manually, it's not a big deal. And why don't you do me a favor and that little matplotlib um, stuff that you have for plotting the accuracy and whatnot. Can you just cop copy that little section and put it in snippets for other people? Okay, sure. So some of you may use TensorBoard for the first two and then matplotlib for the last one, okay? And maybe you don't like the way it looks. They're not uniform, they're different, whatever. And then you want to use matplotlib for all of them. You can do that, that's fine. I switched to matplotlib because TensorFlow, I just didn't like it. I, really I mean, honestly, you're going to use matplotlib if you use PyTorch anyway. So, I mean, yeah. you might as well. And it's good experience to use matplotlib. So choose going to put that in there. Uh, you know, don't blow her up with questions. Please spend a little bit of time trying it. You have to experiment with it, of course. And if you could be so kind to even include the required import statements, that would be really nice. Okay. Copy oh, those from wait, the top. So the, the PyTorch one does have to be manual, though. Like, there's nothing like TensorBoard or that. There is. It's called TensorBoard X, but we're not going to go into it. Okay. And it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't have to be manual. I mean, you can, in this case... And like, for example, in the code I have for PyTorch, it's adding all of those losses and accuracies to a list. So you can plot that list. Oh, okay. Okay. Or just, just going, okay. So uh, who's, who are we looking at here? Is this you, Lee? Yeah. Okay, go back to PyCharm. Uh, quick question. Yeah. Um, is it okay if our train accuracy and test accuracies are split? Yeah. yeah, it's fine. Okay, because I, I, I don't love it, but that's fine. Yeah, because I'm as of right now, I don't know how to combine them in TensorBoard. So yeah, that's okay. okay. All right, all right. Put uh, go go down more, Lee. Uh, scroll down a little bit more, a little bit more, and then right there. No, 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 no. Go up. Go up. Go up a little bit more, and a little bit more. Right there. Put an exit statement on 75, line 75. 
uh, put the exit. Yeah. Now try to run the model. See, right click. Not human right. No, you got to right click in the code. Oh, I see. Yeah. Seems to work fine to me. It, it no, did no, 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 no. Don't do anything. Don't do anything. Go back to the where you were. No, in the run, all the way to the left. All the way to the left. Okay, this one. Yeah, and just don't don't move yet. Okay. Yeah, it's gonna slow. That's fine. That's fine. So when are we gonna finally be able to use the cluster GPUs to make it faster? Right now. You can go use it right now. I guess how, so I, I how do we prepare the Slurm script? We just go in and edit the one that was from yesterday. So you know how it said. Yeah, I didn't know how to go here, but it's two completely different like uh... Let me say this. Okay, so yeah. did it, Brandon probably didn't talk about Anaconda environments yet. So um, Lee, the code works fine. Okay, wait, thanks. Okay. You're welcome. So for the rest mm -hmm. of you, um, okay, so um, if you can edit that Slurm script on your own, you can go use Newton right now. If you can figure out, I'm 90, oh, first of all, let me say this. Everything Brandon's gonna talk about tomorrow is already on the GitHub repo, the Linux tutorial, okay? I'm pretty sure, actually, let's just, let me just do this real quick and we'll stop. I mean, I'm 99% sure that you use sudo in front of conda create, okay? So instead of just typing conda create dash in the name of your environment, Python, I don't know why. Okay, see, look, look, cluster, conda environments. Newton and environments. He talks to you about SCP and how to do it. Okay. He talks to you about environments in Newton. Module avail, module load. It's even the correct names that are on there already. Use the, oh, it's not, it's not sudo, it's s run. That's what it is, that's right. You have to use the s run command. So test, I think you and I talked about this yesterday. It's not sudo, it's s run. It's another four letter s word. Okay, so if you try to create a conda environment and this doesn't work, then use S run in front of it, okay? All right, so that being said, I mean, if you wanna go through this stuff, you can start using Newton right away. Um, but, you know, um, otherwise I would just recommend, um, you know, Make sure the code is working in PyCharm on your machine. That's step one. Once it's working, just copy and paste it all into a, a collab file. You're gonna have to use your, you know, your good sense to figure out what other files go along with that. I can't tell you everything, okay? You guys are smart enough to figure that stuff out. And then just, um, and then just get your results there. And then you can even jump back to PyCharm and use Matplot library there to plot your stuff, you know? But um, as far as the Slurm script is concerned. One comment about uh, getting stuff from Colab. It's kind of, I've, I've looked at some tutorials on how to get files from it. It's uh, the, the tutorials, in my opinion, look fairly hard, um, but the comments on there say it's super easy. So. I don't know, but uh, um, you can do um, on Colab. You can do the the, um, the the magic with the tensor board, and uh, and then it shows up. The tensor board shows up in the Colab, and nice. you can and you can just screenshot that to get your graphs, and then put that in your uh, your. Uh, um, let, let me let me let slides. me piggyback off what he's saying. I want to put some things in perspective because very soon you will never have to use Colab again this summer. Okay. 
So don't spend too much time worrying about getting your collab stuff nice. I'm not taking away anything from what Michael's saying. That is a very good trick. I like that. But just keep in mind to put it all in perspective. Very soon, you're going to have GPUs that will smoke those. So it's not worth spending a whole lot of time. Um, very soon, you will have. Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying if like, because for me, yeah. um, I can't, I couldn't get Keras uh, to, to work on my GPU. Yeah. Um, so Colab is like 20 times faster than what I got on my computer. <laughs> okay. So um, I had, I basically have to use Colab at this point because yeah. I, I haven't, you know, gotten uh, Newton working yet. Um, but uh, so that that's the reason why I had, I wanted to get TensorBoard working on Colab yeah. is because, uh, you know, I could get the, the screenshots from that. All right. Let me, let me, let me throw in one more thing and we're going to be done. Here's, here's how I recommend it, okay? Right now, you guys are looking at this idea of a submit Slurm script, and I, I can see, I know how I would be. And it's like, in order to use, in order to run my code on Newton, I have to figure out the submit Slurm script. And in order to figure out the submit Slurm script, I gotta go through all that stuff it has in there, and blah, blah, blah. Here's what I recommend to you. Keep this in mind. When you submit a job, submit, or sbatch submit.slurm, okay? That slurm script doesn't have to have anything in it other than very few parameters. You don't have to load any modules. You don't have to do anything. You can literally just say echo, hello world, and then in the job in one minute. Does that make sense? My recommendation to you to minimize the amount of knowledge required to start using slurm scripts, you, you harvest, a lot of that stuff out of the Slurm script. And you just do something very basic to start to feel comfortable with, I can run a Slurm script that prints hello world to my screen. No GPUs required, nothing like that. Does that make sense? Do that and you're on the right track, okay? Okay. Um, yeah, that's it. I'll see you guys back at two, okay? Two or 2.30. Uh, it's two. Oh, okay. Wait, a uh, quick question. Um, has to be two because there's a guy presenting it too. Dr. Uh, Robot's presenting. Before you um, uh, use a file, um, like a program file in a Slurm script, yeah. you have to have um, like uploaded that? Yes, that's right. Okay. So for all eight of you, just upload that with MOBAX term. For okay. Tess and for Robert Lake, use the page I just showed you for SCP or talk to me and I'll help you with it. But since you guys are on Max already, it, the amount of work required to do this is much less. So I'm less worried about you guys. Plus, I'm very familiar with that environment. So what we can talk in our secret chat. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. All right. I'll see you guys soon. Okay. See it too. Don't be, please don't be late to this one. Okay. This is a professor at UCF. Okay.